Uh, now let me uh, turn uh, to uh, Karsten. Um, uh, my question uh, is uh, similar to, to the one I raised uh, to uh, Florian, namely the role of the housing uh, markets and uh, again also there uh, in Estonia the housing prices doubled between uh, 2005 and 2007 just uh, uh, within a very short period of time. What, what are your experiences with measures in, in curbing uh, these developments? Okay. If if the I mean the, the answer to what was our success in curbing the prices, then the answer is the global financial crisis that did the trick. Um, but beyond that, our our uh, experience was sort of a a long list of disappointments. Uh, Estonia introduced a macro potential regulation very early. We did not call it that raised the reserve requirements to 15%, I mean substantially above what sort of is within the normal reach, and nothing happened. Uh, the, the central bank tried to convince the authorities to, or the government to drop the tax deductibility of interest payments. That was politically not possible. They did run as quite substantial uh, fiscal surplus, but that apparently also had no effect. So it... Uh, the, at a certain stage, 2006-07, there was sort of a bit of um, a feeling that nothing could really be done. And uh, I should say that I live in a, in, in a place where they were building in front of my house, to the side of my house, in the, at the back of my house. And I was putting it into my evening prayer that the boom would stop. Uh, it was a little bit too effective, my, my prayers. Um, but if we should try to, so if we have this picture 2005, 6, 7 of a boom in credit, a boom in housing prices, which were almost unstoppable, then I think we, if we sort of should analyze where does it come from, then we have to look at, uh, at the uh, foreign capital flows. The big surprise of joining the EU was how popular Estonia suddenly became. Such a small, tiny country in the corner of the globe, and suddenly there were lots of investors who wanted to put their money into, into my little country. So this sort of confidence shock, which was then sort of having its self-reinforcing dynamics, was simply wilder than we had, uh, had uh, expected. 16% current account deficit in 2007. Uh, I have done a little bit of work myself on these capital flows. Uh, I have a paper from the, uh, the ECB working paper series uh, which came out a few weeks ago where we try to correlate uh, competitiveness measures and capital flows. And we can find absolutely no explanatory power in, in competitiveness. Yes, the competitiveness of Estonia and other European countries declined during uh, the boom, but it it's the causality is not from competitiveness to capital flows. There is a working paper from, let me get the names correct here, Sanchez and Varu, I don't know, I'll give up on that one. It's an, a World Bank working paper from December where they, uh, where they uh, make war models for, for, the, for the EU and they again find that nothing, no domestic variables have any explanatory power vis-a-vis -vis the current account balance. Current account, the current account balance is sort of something exogenous happening. Um, I'm working with, a, with a, 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 a friend, colleague now on, on trying to correlate cap, uh, foreign capital flows and domestic credit. And we can certainly see co-integration and we can see dynamics from the current account to domestic credit. So, at least a lesson I think one should take out of the uh, boom was that there is a need to look at the current account balance. Um, and we, of course, these numbers were so wild in Estonia and some of my uh, of the countries or my colleagues here that, of course, we looked at them. But for a long time, we said, ah, this is foreign direct investments. Foreign direct investments are good, and therefore, it's just a healthy part of the convergence process. And we were cheated, 
because lots of these foreign direct investments, they went into uh, real estate companies, they were uh, foreign banks buying domestic banks just to have a platform for expanding lending. So uh, we, we were uh, too, too hesitant to, to or sort of, we, we were sort of disregarding the warning signals coming from the, the, from the current account balance because we had these good stories. We do not have these good stories anymore. It's a, it's a total uh, net capital inflow, which is of interest. Maybe the growth uh, flows are also of interest. Um, ST, uh, I don't know if you have more time. Bank of Estonia became the uh, macro potential agent in Estonia last week. We celebrated it this week by starting increasing the reserve requirements to the banks uh, because we do have a picture of so now the story was how crazy it was that housing prices increased or doubled in a couple of years. But from 2009 to, 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 to 2013, property prices in Tallinn, the capital, has gone up by 80%. So in some sense, we have the same issue now, namely that we have uh, at least a tendency to, uh, uh, to for a, a housing uh, bubble. This, the tragic thing is that Estonia, as many other countries, have seen a sort of divergence within the regions. The property prices in rural Estonia are still at this very minimum they took after the crisis. So we have the, the big city of Tallinn is a big city, number city number two also. We have in, in, uh, rapidly increasing housing prices, but, not, but the, while we have absolutely subdued price developments in the countryside on the rest of Estonia. In some sense, Estonia is not any longer optimal currency area, which is a bit scary. Um, I think some of the comments which came here around about uh, uh, micro potential regulation is something uh, which sounds very good in my ears. It's not something we have had a tradition for in Estonia. I hope we will, uh, we will learn from our uh, 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 Polish and Romanian uh, friends, uh, next time we, uh, our bubble sort of really uh, uh, gets very big. May I just uh, add another question, which is not so much probably related uh, to financial stability, but um, Estonia was uh, negotiating joining the euro area at the time uh, yeah, when the euro crisis was looming. And, uh, for, with hindsight of the experience um, of the last few years, what were the benefits from your personal point of view of Estonia being part of the Euro uh, during the crisis? Um, Estonia was not part of the Euro area during the very height of the crisis 2008 and 2009. Estonia uh, joined in 2011. Uh, so we had a fixed exchange rate, a currency board, uh, and there certainly were many who recommended that this should be scrapped and some kind of devaluation or something like that should take place. Uh, Krugman wrote a lot about the excellent country of Latvia, but also about Estonia in the same uh, sentence, typically. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's no exchange rate regime which is fantastic at... At, in, at all times and in all kinds of weather. Um, the magic about the currency board in Estonia in, the, in 2008-9, when the waves were at the highest, was, in some sense, we didn't, I mean, that they were fixed, the exchange rate were fixed. And, uh, and uh, we didn't see this sort of extreme volatility as you uh, saw in some other countries. Iceland had to impose capital controls. Iceland, the Icelandic economy is one half of the Estonian economy, so sort of comparable. So um, at least we avoided that, but of course we also didn't get a depreciation to, to smooth the downturn. Uh, we had this crazy composition of, uh, of borrowing. We had, uh, I think, 80, 85% of the borrowing in euros. Uh, the central bank couldn't really discourage it because the whole story was that we had this fixed exchange rate and that was forever. So, so um, of course, we couldn't discourage it. Um, I would say, on the other hand, if you, if you look at it, the, having a fixed exchange rate during the 
the current crisis was not really the worst thing which could happen. It was a symmetric shock, hitting all countries in Europe, and interest rates uh, plummeted uh, in the Eurozone as in all other places. So in some sense, you can't get very much lower than zero with your interest rate, and, and that was essentially what we got from the Eurozone. So, so it wasn't really a big, I would say it wasn't really a big issue. What, let me end by sort of a political economy story, namely that the Estonian politicians um, had tried to get into the Eurozone uh, in the good times, but never didn't manage because of inflationary pressures in Estonia during the boom. And the politicians said, um, they had a meeting in, uh, in December 2008, they saw the, the GDP collapsing, uh, they saw deflationary pressures in the economy, and they said, now is the time to try to get into paradise or get into the Eurozone. Um, and that was possible because Estonia had the fixed exchange rate, was in the ERM2, so then uh, this uh, uh, mastery criterion could be ticked off right away, and the politicians could start uh, concentrating on the next challenge, which would be to uh, avoid the deficit to be bigger than 3%, the fiscal deficit to be bigger than 3% in a situation where GDP dropped 14%. Uh, they somehow managed, I still don't really understand how they managed, uh, but at least the, the fixed exchange rate became sort of the platform for a political orientation in 2000, at the very end of 2008, 2009. The story, whatever question you ask, the answer was, we should try to get into the Eurozone. Um, now, uh, finally, uh, let's talk about Slovenia. Um, What's interesting is that since the accession of European Union um, to the European Union in 2004, Slovenia has turned uh, from being one of the best uh, performers uh, in macroeconomics terms uh, to one of uh, a more critical performer. So how where do you see the main driving forces behind these developments? Thank you. Mm, thank you. So uh, I would say that uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the monetary and fiscal policy had a clear strategy, a target to enter the EU and monetary union as soon as possible. There was a uh, focus on uh, price stability, uh, on nominal interest rate convergence, and uh, the, uh, managing the exchange rate. The, um, uh, the public finances at that time were really not an issue, as debt to GDP was around 25% and deficit uh, was below. Uh, percent. But already in 2005, Bank of Slovenia made a statement with two relevant and traced two relevant issues for the following years. One was the risk of overheated uh, economy, and the second, uh, the structural reforms. So, uh, looking backward, it was the right moment for such a statement. The credit growth at, at that time was around 25% and uh, performing a, a, historical, a simulation on historical data uh, it, uh, with regard to credit to GDP gap, it shows that uh, would it be already available, it would be the right time to introduce the counter-cyclical capital buffer at that time, late 2004, uh, early 2005. Um, as due to Bank of Slovenia's sterilization of large uh, capital uh, inflows in late 1990s and early 2000s, Banks had uh, like a one third of the balance sheet in investments in uh, securities. So, uh, abandoned, uh, a lot of liquidity in uh, banks' uh, balance sheet, which together with uh, nominal uh, interest rate convergence led to a very high uh, credit growth. And additionally, uh, later on, uh, as the domestic savings were uh, not uh, uh, sufficient to finance the rapid credit growth, banks uh, uh, rapidly expanded their borrowing uh, abroad uh, to foreign uh, banks. Uh, uh, these sources of finances were um, more favorable in terms of price, and also at that time seems like uh, being unlimited in quantity. Uh, in 2007, it was then clearly said by the Bank of Slovenia 
that uh, this is uh, the current the, the status status of the economy is a shift from macroeconomic equilibrium that the credit growth is over excessive the growth of uh, capital formation at that time was uh, 20 percent mostly on account of construction like uh, roads and uh, the interest rates uh, at that time uh, that could have stimulate domestic uh, savings and uh, limit the demand the credit demand were not uh, anymore under uh, national jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, this uh, large amount of liquidity and availability of funding uh, encouraged banks to search for yield, and they introduced a lot of new uh, products that brought uh, high risk to, to clients and also to banks, like uh, uh, Swiss francs uh, loans that were already mentioned by other uh, uh, countries, and uh, also loans uh, for uh, uh, investing in uh, securities. Um, there were also tries uh, like um, um, issuing housing loans with uh, 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 repaying the principal at maturity. Uh, happily, this uh, was not really a success story for banks, but on the other side, banks uh, uh, were uh, lending uh, with high growth rates to sectors which were already uh, which already had a high leverage, and uh, sectors whose performance was uh, linked to to the business cycle, and uh, banks also uh, financed uh, leverage uh, buyouts. Um, <coughs> so banks were uh, expanding lending primarily to increase their market shares, and uh, the prevailing expectation at that, at that time was uh, that uh, the economic growth would remain high for a long uh, term. Um, um, and then the escalation of uh, financial uh, crisis uh, and the undermined confidence of financial markets uh, resulted in a complete uh, turn in the supply of loans. Uh, previously, uh, it was uh, the uh, credit demand that determines uh, the credit growth but then it was uh, uh, it turned to um, the, the loans became entirely dependent on on funds so uh, the amount of funds the banks could provide um, starting in 2007 the first uh, uh, the first financial turmoil didn't affect uh, slovenian banks as their uh, exposure to subprime mortgage and uh, fi uh, structured financial instruments was only like uh, half percent of uh, their balance sheet, but uh, it affected uh, the Slovenian economy through uh, uh, the drop in foreign demand, and it exposed the uh, banks on their funding uh, structure. So um, banks at that time had one third of the balance sheet uh, in their liabilities to foreign banks, and uh, the financial uh, crisis tightened uh, conditions for raising new loans and uh, shortened, shortened maturities and increased the, the risk premium. So from the peak, uh, uh, from the peak amount of uh, liabilities to foreign banks till today, Slovenian banks, uh, Slovenian banks will pay 12 billion euros of liabilities to foreign banks. And the current level of five uh, billions represents 12% of their uh, balance sheet, which is only one third uh, the amount it was uh, on, in the share uh, it was at uh, uh, late 2008. Banks replaced these uh, foreign fun funds with uh, uh, government guaranteed uh, bonds, uh, with government deposits, uh, euro system funds, and they also refocused to to households or let's say to retail deposits and uh, they repaid the liabilities to foreign banks also by uh, by uh, loan repayments of uh, performing uh, clients. Uh, so the banking system may, made net uh, repayment to, to foreign banks but uh, on the other side the, the government uh, issued uh, bonds and undertook the borrow borrowing abroad and deposit a large part of these funds in, uh, in banks. So uh, the, the uh, overall net position against the uh, rest of the world didn't improve by banks repaying uh, the liabilities. But then uh, as the uh, necessary structural reforms and fiscal consolidation was uh, delayed 
and the situation in the banking system worsened with uh, uh, increased uh, share of non-performing uh, loans and lack of uh, capital. The uh, ra rating agencies uh, reacted and, uh, with several down downgrades of the sovereign and banks' ratings, and this raised the, the funding cost and restricted the, assets, the access to financial markets. So um, uh, it has to be said that the reason for the second wave uh, of the financial crisis was also uh, the uh, over-leveraging in the corporate and in the banking system. Uh, the crisis in Slovenia revealed uh, uh, the weaknesses in the business models of banks and corporates. On one side, high debt to equity uh, ratios in corporate sector, and in banks, uh, this over dependence on wholesale funding. So banks are reducing their uh, dependence on wholesale funding currently, or for a continuous uh, time now, for several years. Uh, by increasing the uh, deposits, but even more by uh, contracting the, the lending. And this uh, uh, results in, uh, in accelerated uh, decreasing of uh, loan-to-deposit ratio. Um, but uh, this poses additional uh, systemic risk as uh, it, it affects uh, uh, structural liquidity ratios of banks uh, decrease corporate access to liquidity and uh, transfer uh, the, uh, the increase the uh, share of uh, credit risk transfer to deponents and also uh, such behavior restricts banks ability to to generate profit and capital in this environment corporates uh, face the problem uh, how to reduce their high uh, debt to equity uh, ratios in, re uh, in the environment of recession and with uh, limited uh, alternative financing with uh, uh, financially weak owners and uh, numerous institutional and uh, legal uh, barriers that uh, prevent a timely resolution. And uh, I think that the awareness should be made that uh, correcting the, the restructuring of banks and corporates, it's a mutual uh, process. So the faster, uh, the faster it takes place in banks, the, the slower it can uh, take uh, place in the corporate sector. Restructuring is always associated with uh, deleveraging. And to which extent do you think is uh, this deleveraging uh, process, which is associated to the general restructuring of the Slovenian banking system, uh, weighing very much on growth. Do you have internal um, projections of this effect? Will you distinguish uh, supply side from demand driven? Yes, uh, so um, it, it's, uh, uh, it is affected by the both sides. So uh, the, the credit demand uh, is uh, definitely uh, decreased due to uh, economic environment developments in the economic environment and the credit worthiness of corporate sector decreased. But also we, we see the, the supply side uh, limitations because, uh, and this is reflected right in these uh, recent periods, uh, as um, um, on one side we see that, so the survey data show us that uh, the banks are uh, tightening the, the credit standards and this uh, have, uh, didn't stop. Uh, already and uh, there we ha also have a survey on uh, credit demand by corporate sector which is not covered by uh, banks and this uh, excess credit demand is uh, rising. Uh, the, the third uh, argument is uh, that uh, banks are uh, uh, recapitalized but they st still don't increase the lending. And also the, the sentiment uh, indicators, the, uh, the climate in the uh, corporate sector is improving in manufacturing as well as in the cor uh, in construction sector. And we see that uh, the, this excess demand that I previously mentioned is largest with the banks that uh, most rapidly decrease their loan to deposit ratios. Thank you. Uh, I will close this uh, panel discussion now. Uh, thank you uh, for your interest. I thank all the panelists for their very valuable, insightful um, uh
presentations and discussions. And um, um, I think this uh, panel was extremely interesting also to me, uh, for instance, to learn that some of your countries, some of the countries um, at the podium have already implemented or discussed macropotential measures years uh, before the crisis uh, burst. And uh, I think uh, this was uh, uh, very, very interesting to all of us.